so about jeffrey chaucer <clears throat> so let me tell you jeffrey chaucer period covers from 1340 to 1400 and so in this british poetry i told you you will be studying poems written from early 14th century to late 20th century and see it is not possible to give any particular literary name to any uh, period but for the sake of you know for the sake of uh, demarcation see we have given certain names to literary uh, names to certain period so the beginning or the ending of a social or literary age cannot be definitely dated i told it it cannot be marked so you know certain important literary or historical events will be marked as the beginning or the ending of a particular literary period so 1340 is marked uh, as the beginning beginning of the chaucerian era just because uh, jeffrey chaucer was born in the year 1314 and the era ends i mean the jeffrey chaucer's era ends in 1400 just because he died similarly you know elizabethan era 1558 to 1603 because queen Els elizabeth she ascended to a throne in the year 1558 and she died in 1603 so certain historical or literary events mark the date or beginning or ending of a particular literary age okay so i hope you got the uh, um, an outline or an awareness about how these literary period or literary phases are marked okay so now let us discuss why jeffrey chaucer is known as the father of english poetry <clears throat> yeah so he belonged to the middle age and uh, you know he is the one who has standardized english and he preferred east midland dialect in his writing actually during that time during middle age or 13 uh, up to for uh, yeah 13 to 15 century there were so many dialects in english hmm? uh, there were so many dialects in england say like uh, five dominant dialects were there so you know people who speak one dialect hmm, they cannot understand the other one because uh, dialects hmm, uh, are entirely different from one another just like not like th that we have in uh, kerala but it is entirely different from uh, east midland and south dialect etc were entirely different so it is chaucer who you know standardized the english dialect that is why he is known as the father of english poetry okay so <clears throat> yeah james jo uh, lowell english critic once said that chaucer found his english a dialect and left it as a language okay according to edward albert another crit literary critic hmm, called him the earliest of the great moderns and the morning star of renaissance see why this person has become great importance in the history of english literature because he is the one who standardized english then the first one to teach art of versification yeah versification poetry writing isn't it now and he is the one who introduced rhyme royal scheme to english poetry okay or chaucerian stanza so rhyme royal consists of seven lines uh, i see usually in iambic pentameter what do you mean by iambic pentameter rhymed iambic couplet is said to be rhyme iambic pentameter uh, okay so that we will study see uh, 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 how many of you are familiar with scansion and all how many of you have learned um, familiar with meter rhyming scheme etc i told you this person introduced rhyme royal to english poetry rhyme royal is nothing but i rhyme iambic pentameter okay so there will be uh, five feet 5 feet in a line 
five feet in a line, uh, it will be first line and the second line will be rhyming. That is why it is said to be rhyme iambic pentameter. So rhyming scheme is A, B, A, B, and B, C, Z. Rhyme Royal was adapted from French ballad and Italian stanza. Then he's, uh, he has also introduced eight line decasyllabic stanza and heroic couplet. So this person has, uh, you know, uh, he has introduced many literary uh, techniques to English poetry. Now, about, we know that English is the youngest language, isn't it? It is the youngest language. And most of the words in English has been borrowed from, uh, you know, from fr uh, French, Latin and Spanish. Yeah. So this person was a, a voracious hmm, reader and he was well versed in Latin and French classics. Okay. And he modeled Boccaccio and Decameron. See, uh, the Book of Duchess, his first book, the Book of Duchess had a prof, uh, has been influenced by the courtly romance, I mean, uh, French courtly romance and ballads. Okay, now uh, see, his chief models were Dandy, Dande Alighieri and Francisco Petrap and Giovanni Boccaccio. So these are the three prominent uh, Latin and Italian writers uh, who have influenced Geoffrey Chaucer. Okay, so anyway, uh, it is from Boccaccio, Strollius, and Cressidi. He bo uh, borrowed the material uh, for, uh, yeah, Canterbury Tales. Okay, Boca uh, it's from Boccaccio's, I'm sorry, Boccaccio's Decameron. It is from Boccaccio's Decameron. He bo borrowed the material for Strollius and Cressida and uh, Canterbury Tales. Yeah. So I hope you know that this Canterbury Tale is also a group. A group tale or a pilgrim tale. It's a group. Uh, Canterbury tale is a group tale or a pilgrim tale, uh, just like Boccaccio's Decameron. Okay, Boccaccio's Decameron is a, is also a group tale, hmm? uh, collection of stories. But uh, you know, Joseph's tale is much more versatile than that of Boccaccio's. And he has see uh, he has borrowed several other stories and features from Petrarch's. Petrarch is another Italian uh, poet. Okay, he has also borrowed so many literary techniques from Petrarch. Then another one that is Dante Dante Alighieri. Okay, so Chaucer became famous by trans translating Dante's uh, works into English. Now, I told you he belonged to the Middle English, the most famous among, uh, uh, yeah, the most famous writer among uh, Middle English writers. Okay, so evolution of English. So English can be, uh, uh, see, I told you English is the English language. So Old English, 1597 AD to 1100 AD. So the most, you know, uh, famous work of this period is Beowulf. You don't know, uh, the author is anonymous, I mean, anonymous. Anyway, the old Middle English literature, you know, it retained so many qualities of Germanic, old Germanic. I uh, hope you know that English language has evolved from old Germanic language. So it means, uh, yeah, it has so many features of uh, German, uh, German, Germanic languages, then Middle English, Middle English period from 1100 AD to 1500 AD. And Chaucer is the uh, prominent writer of this period. Uh, see, during this period, English was mostly influenced by French and Latin. Okay, and Canterbury Tale is the uh, yeah, prominent work, most important work of this period. Now, modern English period, 1500 AD to 21st century. Starting from Shakespeare, Milton's, yeah, Swift, Wordsworth, etc. Uh, I mean, to the present writers. So, before start uh, starting Canterbury Tales, let's discuss the language. So, the one that we have now, it is entirely different from that of the Middle English. Okay, 
I told you during that fifteenth uh, century or during uh, yeah a period from eleven hundred eighty to fifteenth uh, century, English was entirely different from uh, the one that we have now. Okay, so there were there uh, there were many dialects there. So you know the way they pronounce certain words is entirely different. Okay, so you know <clears throat> the language of the medieval in uh, I mean the prominent languages uh, were French, Latin, and English. And French was the language of aristocracy, Latin uh, the language of scholars, priests, and clergy. Yeah. Clergy people, uh, people. Then English was the language of commoners. Then, apart from that, pronunciation. See, the pronunciation was entirely different. In Middle English, A is broad as the modern English father. See, you see the word. Are you able to see the word W H A N, which is sim similar to when. Uh, w H E N when is pronounced in those time as one. This is the ap uh, the second word is April. Right now we pronounce it as April, but those days they pronounce it as April. April. A has got the pronunciation of A in father. Ah, March, Bath, Hat, Smart. See wherever they uh, wherever. We have vowel letters. Vowel letters. We pronounce it. We stress it. The first one is when. In modern English, the first one is when. The second one is April. The third one is March. Next one is back, and that is hat, sm small, and ram. But in medieval English, we pronounce it as one April, March, bath, hat, smaller, ram, like that. Okay. Now, short e has the same pronunciation in <clears throat> modern English. So, small, uh, smiley, sooty, melodia, young, seek. So, you understood the difference in pronunciation. Wherever <clears throat> there is a vowel letter, we stressed it, unlike modern English. So, yeah, long e has a pronunciation. Hmm? Long E has a long A sound. Sweat. In modern English, we pronounce it as sweet. Isn't it? Sweet. But in medieval English, we pronounce it as sweat. Brat. Hat. Silk. Okay, like that. E is pronounced as A sound. Okay. Now, G. You see, g sound is guttural. Guttural means a sound that is harsh coming from the deep throat. Deep throat. The first one is drought. Drought. In modern English. In medieval English, it is pronounced as drought. Drought. Naig. Naig. Drought. G, g, g. G sound is guttural. Okay. Uh, in modern English, we simply pronounce it as draw, night. But in Middle English, draw, night. Then we know that there is no trilling sound in English. Only in Malayalam, we will, uh, you know, uh, we will roll our tongue. So, you know how these words are pronounced? April, tender. This is tender. In modern English, this is tender. In medieval English, tender, April, rilling. Okay. This is courage. In modern English, it is courage. In medieval English, courageous. R -r -r -r. So basically, they, they use their tongue. Just like in Malayalam, they rilled and rolled their tongue. Hello, are you people there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, are you yeah, able to okay? Are you able to understand the difference in pronunciation? You know the spellings are the spellings are a bit different, but don't worry. Uh, I hope you got your textbook, isn't it? Have you got your um study those study material? So, if you yeah yeah, if if you have your Igno study material, uh, at the back of your text you have the translation. Don't worry, you have. 
middle english as well as modern english translation so when you study this poem when you study canterbury tales just go hand in hand let's read let's read the middle english okay please please now mute the mic mute the mic so when you read this poem you know first you read the middle english version after that after reading the 10 uh, 10 lines you may go to the modern version compare and study just compare and study so you will understand it's not that a big deal because we know that see sweet but only the pronunciation and the slight difference in the spelling okay sweet swatta second one is breath brakta next one is heat heat say next one is seek sak like that drug naig so chaucer's period that is a uh, medieval period okay so his period was a uh, you know a period of great social changes hmm? england has witnessed a rapid uh, political social and economical changes okay so you know uh, during that period a church was very much corrupted basically it was a period of feudal lords so all those feudal lords um you know that entire world was crumbling hmm? during that time uh, i told you uh, england was politically unrest hmm? was a great uh, witness a great change uh, in the realms of social political and economic field okay so the major changes feudalism growth of cities you know feudalism declined during 14th century feudalist england uh, witnessed that very uh, decline of you know feudal lords or uh, feudalism then it witnessed the growth of cities then rise of middle class then okay yeah england was thrice swept by plagues black death okay so the population of england was reduced to you know uh, one by third it's to its one by third and it has witnessed yes. yeah then holy wars i hope you are familiar with the 110 years of war between england and france it witnessed the yeah the great war then growth of the church and corruption church was very much corrupted and it also witnessed you know uh, the very uh, ri- uh, rise of many university oxford cambridge like that it is only, uh, it is in 11th and 13th century so many universities were uh, constructed like cambridge and oxford okay so these were the major major changes in england so not it what were the major changes in england witness um, a tremendous change in social political and economic field uh, decline in feudalism it witnessed the growth of cities then merchant class they emerged it also witnessed uh, play uh, i mean death by plagues black death then it was during his period that Yeah, uh, yeah. England um, had a uh, yeah. Eng- uh, the battle between um, England and France. Hundred and ten years of uh, war happened. Then growth of the church and the corruption related to it. Then the very growth of the university. Now, so I hope you have got uh, an awareness about the very political period and how the uh, and the literary characteristics of the period. now let's move on to canterbury tales so this is the the first block deals with canterbury tales you don't have to study the entire canterbury tale you only have prologue to canterbury prologue to can only prologue to canterbury is there apart from prologue to canterbury you have uh, you know non spree tale non spree tale canterbury tale is a single work but it is a collection of stories hmm? collection of many tales out of that you have only prologue and only one tale to study you don't have to study the entire stuff all right so we have already discussed that chaucer is the father of english language and why he has been called the father of english language this person is the first person to standardize english he introduced many literary forms and technique to english poetry like rhyme royal hmm? then yeah he introduced the deca- it's uh, the casyllabic uh l- forms to english poetry yeah like that so 
uh, Canterbury Tale is a collection of 24 stories about 17,000 lines. So there are total 17,000 lines. Okay. So it is a story about storytelling, just like Panjadantra, hmm? Panjadantra Tales, then Arabian Nights, isn't it? Uh, there are so, hmm, sto it is a story within a story. Story goes on. It's a story about storytelling, just like Arabian Nights. Okay. You know, Arabian Nights is a bit more complicated because it is story within a story. It goes like that. Now, yeah. The very uniqueness of the work lies in its characterization. There are 29 major characters. Okay, there are 29 characters, excluding Chaucer and his host. There are 29 characters. That is why John Bryden, father of yeah, English criticism. Okay, about him you will study in the fifth block. John Bryden, father of English criticism, called Geoffrey Chaucer. Yeah. I mean, his famous work, Canterbury Tales, he, he, uh, he said that here is God's plenty. Here is God's plenty. Why it is said to be here is God's plenty? Because Chaucer was able to portray, uh, he was able to give, you know, the complete picture of England uh, during uh, 14th century. Okay. Using all the 29 characters, he has given uh, a complete picture of England. I mean, the uh, life and yeah, situation or the very uh, features of the uh, people from different strata of English society. All characters in prologue to Canterbury Tales, you know, yeah, I told you they have drawn from the 14th century English society. So the story goes like this. You know, the starting goes like this. There are 29 pilgrims. I told you there are 29 major characters. 29 characters are starting. Hmm? Uh, uh, yeah, the journey from Tabard into St. Thomas Beckett, a shrine of St. Thomas Beckett in Canterbury. Let me tell you St. Thomas Beckett. I hope many of you are familiar with St. Thomas Beckett. St. Tom, uh, yeah, Thomas Beckett. Hmm? Actually, uh, you know, he was a close friend of Henry IV uh, and he was also a libertine. But when he became, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury, hmm, he changed a lot. At first, he was also a libertine like the king, Henry. And later, uh, you know, uh, when he got associated with Archbishop hmm, and after his death, he became the Archbishop of Canterbury. So his character has changed. Okay. From a libertine, he became entirely good. And he went against all those things that were against Christian doctrine. So he has excommunicated many, you know, uh, immoral character, I mean, moral people. Like that he was forced to excommunicate, uh, I mean, the illegal son of Henry, okay, Henry Fourth. So that was the reason. Uh, that was the immediate reason why this Henry Fourth and uh, you know Thomas Becket hmm, uh, feud. Later, upon the order hmm, uh, given by Henry Fourth, Thomas Becket was murdered in the Canterbury. I mean, uh, that church. Okay, he was murdered by four knights in the Canterbury. And later, he was, you know, canonized and he became the saint. Saint of Canterbury, St. Thomas Beckett. And, you know, people go to Canterbury because the place is believed to have a great, uh, you know, um, all those people who suffer from some kind of disease or some type of disease, they went to Canterbury because they believe that this person is quick in giving blessings to them. He, he has got some healing power. That is the, why the, uh, I mean, people uh, go on pilgrimage to Canterbury. Anyway, let me tell you, <clears throat> this place is from what, 55 miles away from England. One second. Yeah, 55 miles away from England. Right now, see, at present, it's not a uh, you know great distance, but 
back in 14th to 13th century 55 my, uh, miles is a tiresome journey isn't it that to up on the top of a horse or on feet it, it's a great distance to cover a tiresome journey so you know how they uh, used to travel they will uh, morning from morning to evening they will travel and by night they will take uh, yeah they will stay in some in local inns so yeah they traveled in group so you know uh, canterbury tale is basically the story is told by all those 29 characters actually chaucer has gathered those 29 i mean stories told by 29 characters okay so that's a very basically very summary of the canterbury tales so the <clears throat> total number of characters in canterbury 29 pilgrims plus chaucer chaucer is the poet as well as the narrator he is not only the poet but also narrator of canterbury tales and host of the dafarden so altogether there are 31 members including chaucer and the host there are 31 members so <clears throat> i told you the story is told by the 29 characters form the very base of the canterbury tales so it was the host who suggested about storytelling he is the one who told that they have to tell a story because you know 55 miles is a big distance to cover isn't it it's a big great distance to cover and uh, you know at those time they don't have any kind of uh, entertainment anything like that just like that we have nowadays hmm? so the only way to make that journey more enjoyable or more pleasurable is that they have to tell us stories crack jokes etc okay so he suggested that who i mean the host of the body harry bailey harry bailey is the host of the inn where all these 29 character and chaucer stay for that night okay so he suggested that each pilgrim each pilgrim has to uh, say two tales two stories on the way to canterbury and two tales on the way back home so there are 29 right including chaucer 30 so 30 just count 30 so all these 30 character hmm, uh, have to say two tales on the way to canterbury and two tales on the way back home it's like that see 13 to 2 60 and when they return how many one yeah 60 so 60 plus 60 120 so all together there will be 120 tales that was the suggestion put forward by the host so has to make that journey much more pleasurable and enjoyable okay the best storyteller would be given hmm? and the uh, Uh, see, he says he said that he would act as the judge. Who, Harry Bailey, the host of the inn or the owner of the inn, would judge that story, and the winner would get a sumptuous dinner. The winner, so the prize money is dinner, a sumptuous dinner. Okay, so you know, uh, if Chaucer had completed, if Chaucer had originally. you know uh, you know if he had completed his original plan then there would have 120 tales in total but there are only 24 tales okay he wrote only 24 tales he couldn't complete that 120 tales only 20, 24 tales so canterbury tales is a collection of 24 tales originally originally he planned to write 120 tales but there are only 24 tales so most of the stories occurred on the way to canterbury most of the stories were told on the way to canterbury <clears throat> so i told you the very significance of the place that the place is believed to have uh, some great you know healing qualities that is why all these so all these characters are having some kind of diseases or some kind of problem that is why all of them are going to canterbury not out of any religious purpose okay they don't have any serious religious intention 
not out of any belief or something like that they are going for their personal purposes okay before the beginning of the tales i told you there are 24 tales uh, he doesn't start with the 24 tales before the beginning of the 24 tales he just gives a brief introduction about all his characters see we, we have 29 29 characters right so before starting the tale chaucer gives a brief introduction about all his characters because i told you all all these characters uh, which he has drawn hmm? you know uh, they belong to different strata of english society the one below, uh, one is a knight another one is a squire another one is a you know monk a friar a priest like that it goes like that so, yeah so you know canterbury tale is actually a social documentary it is a social documentary it is a satire social documentary a kind of a history you know it's a kind of a history if one reads hmm, uh, he will get or she will get a picture of 14th century england now you know the spirit whoever reads hmm, whether a reader from 13th century 14th century 15 or 20 or the 21st century uh, you know they won't find it quite old no one is going to find it quite old because you know uh, this tale or canterbury tale it belongs to all era it belongs to all era it, it had stood the time of test i mean reader from all period or uh, readers from all periods can relate uh, the characters with that of their society or with the, that of their you know age so the characterization or the story will never become outdated now these are the major characters host narrator narrator is our chaucer knight is the first character so the verses about knight starts from line 43 squire yeoman priores priores you know priores has been accompanied by a secretary and the secretary is in turn accompanied by three other priests anyway the lines about priores start from 122 you know verses about Monk, 169, Friar, Merchant, Oxford, cl uh, Clerk, Sergeant of Law, Franklin, Gelsman, Carpenter, Weaver, Cook, Skip, uh, you know, Skipper, a Shipman, Doctor, Wife of Bath, you know, Wife of Bath is pronounced as Weef of Bath, Weefy of Bath, Weefy, because I told you the pronunciation is a bit different, Bath. Parson, Plowman, Miller, Mansipal, Reeve, Summoner, Partner. So these are the 31 characters in Canterbury Tales. Now let's see, let's discuss the class structure. The class structure during Chaucer's time. So I told you there were three prominent languages that were French, Latin and English. Isn't it French used by aristocratic class, Latin used by logical class and english by common people so similarly there were uh, there are three prominent you know groups in english uh, i mean england <clears throat> ruling class middle class yeah and a trade class let's see so ruling class uh, knight and squire they belong to ruling class and monk, friar, prior, parson, summoner, partner, they are ecclesiastical characters. You know, characters belong to church, clergy, clergy class. Then middle class people. I told you during 14th, 15th century, English, England witnessed the rise of middle class. According to critics and writers, you know, it is the mediocres or middle class people who are very cunning and shrewd 
when compared to upper class and lower class people middle class are very shrewd and cunning the reason is you know upper class people they simply want to maintain their status they simply want to maintain their status and lower class people they want something to have hmm? they just want to pu uh, push their way like that but middle class people are not like that they wanted to improve their status they really wanted to improve their sta status so they are always hungry or thirsty for money they wanted to improve their life so whenever get they get an opportunity of course they will find some way to make clash between upper class people and down, uh, lower class people and they profited from their fight you know just like a wolf very cunning very shrewd so most of the critics and writers uh, never appro uh, you know never appreciated these middle class people anyway franklin reeve doctor oxford student by vp of bath surgeon of law etc they belong to middle class society now next one is uh, gilsman cook miller house municipal and merchant they belong to the trade class trading class okay then peasant shipman plowman yeoman they belong to the down down trodden or poor class so these were the prominent classes during chaucer's time okay now let's discuss one by one so let me tell you something uh from canterbury tales from british poetry you can expect both essay questions and annotation and about annotation i know it is pretty difficult to cover you know 1000 lines 2000 lines say like that so the best way is if possible try to read at least once so canterbury tales is some about 800 lines okay the one prologue to canterbury the, the that is mentioned uh that is prescribed in your syllabus some about 800 lines okay so you at least if you get time try to go uh, try to read it or else at least try to read the summary not just before the examination by now okay uh, if you want to pass the exam if you if you, are, if you have any serious intention behind studying uh, british poetry then you have to start uh, learning right now itself so you know go through the characteristic features of 29 uh pilgrims then since it is written in middle english go through the you know specific words so whenever you get it for annotation you can easily relate it yes there are 29 characters and they have 29 unique features so even if you get for exam even if you don't uh, read the lines obviously when you if you know the character's features you can easily relate on seeing those specific words or specific terms related with the character you can easily identify the character it's not going to be a big deal so many children or so many students uh, previously asked me see uh, we have lot of points to study how we will identify the annotation like that it's not going to be a big deal that's why i'm telling you first of all just study the political and historical background of the uh, work see polit uh, histo see history and the politics of the, yeah the very history uh, of that period has something to do with the work so first of all you study the political and history <clears throat> background of the work thereafter just go through the summary main features theme theme main idea etc all right then read the summary then uh, read the poem if possible please read the poem all right so you'll be able to memorize when you get the annotation you can easily relate the characters okay now let's start so i told you they have started you know it is in the month of april um the, all pilgrims started their journey to canterbury tales sorry can i'm sorry can the british right okay uh yeah so 
you know april being the first month hmm uh, yeah of, uh, in spring isn't it in spring see, uh, it was a uh, period of spring so the rain was hmm? the rain is very gentle hmm? uh, then warming sun gentle winds etc the nature is in a very pleasant state so it is a perfect time for hmm, uh, short trips and uh, to make pilgrimage and all so 29 characters from every nook and corner of the england hmm, they made their way to canterbury so has to uh, receive the blessing of the blissful martyr that is st thomas becky okay so i told you april hmm, the second month of uh, second month in spring season isn't it march is the first one and april is the second month yeah so april being the second month of spring season yeah these characters from every nook and corner of england started their pilgrimage to canterbury so yeah it was a spring day it was a spring day they started the journey uh from south walk tabard just like uh, hotels hotels tabard is a in in south walk a place in london they started their journey okay so i told you narrator is chaucer chaucer was there in the tabard inn and he was waiting in the tabard uh, inn so has to resume his journey the next day so while he was uh, waiting um, to resume his journey the 29 characters arrived at the inn i told you they started their journey on a spring day from south walk inn and chaucer was already there our narrator chaucer was already there he was waiting to resume his journey next day at that time only all these 29 characters arrived okay and these 29 characters allowed chaucer to jo uh, chaucer to join their company so all to, so the company became a you know now there are 30 members in that company now chaucer is describing uh, his characters one by one and uh, you know the first character he describes in prologue to canterbury is knight is our knight so knight is the man who has got you know uh, the highest rank among the among the pilgrims he is the one with the highest rank so all throughout the journey you know certain type of uh, obeisance is paid to him now what has been said let's see what has been said about knight so he belongs to the ruling class highest among the pilgrims and he has got a fine horse then he wore a dark stained tunic cloth then he is strong hmm? and he had participated in many battles hmm? he is middle aged and he has got a 20 year old son then he is wise modest distinguished chivalrous truthful honorable like that and then you know he has traveled across you uh, you know entire european continent and he has engaged in uh, uh, yeah he has participated in many battles but none of these battles were secular wars all of them were religious wars what is the duty of a knight we know the character we know the features or the characteristic traits of a knight isn't it you might have seen english movies they rescue the weak and isn't it and they rescue the underprivileged characters or the weak people and uh, you know depressed dancers beautiful uh, dancers yeah so and they are very truthful isn't it they are very chivalric that is the you know common features or characteristics of a knight <laughs> but this knight is entirely different let me tell you one more thing whatever thing whatever things or uh, you know uh, chaucer has said about his characters actually he meant exactly opposite of that i repeat if chaucer says something good about a character 
in reality is exactly opposite of that he is you know he has taken an ironic uh, way of narration in canterbury tales is uh, yeah is bit ironic and he has used ironic term and only virtuous uh, 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 there are only a few virtuous character in canterbury tales that is clerk at oxford parson and plowman these are the three virtuous characters rest of the 27 uh, sorry there are 26 characters are highly corrupted 27 characters are highly corrupted mm, parson plowman clerk at oxford these are the only virtuous characters so something see he has uh, he had ridden to mm, battle into both christian and heathen lands so wherever he had been there all those places uh, had witnessed battle so this person is very you know not religious but he is a fanatic he cannot be considered uh, you know has a good night but very uh, he is a hypocrite okay now the next one is squire squire is a son of our knight uh, one who is you know uh, squire is someone who wants to become a knight someone who is training uh, taking training to become a knight so he is the son of our knight then uh, if he is not in service then you know he considers himself as a perfect ladies man he thinks that rest of the ladies are in love with him and he is um, you know he takes meticulous care of his beautiful hair then he is very proud of his appearance and you know he spends his day singing lusty songs composing melodies write poems uh for his beloved and he too has a horse normally we know what's the duty of a knight and a squire their duty is to protect people uh, uh women children from evils and dangers but both the father and the son they are only concerned about themselves one is you know very materialistic or cannot be said as religious but he is a fanatic that is why wherever he had been all those countries or regions have witnessed war and in the case of squire uh, he is someone who is uh, you know apprenticing to become a knight so he should be very you know very serious about his mission but he is not like that if he is not servicing his father if he is not practicing then he rest of the time or not rest of the time he he makes time for it for idle purpose he wastes his time for uh, some you know some futile jobs like singing dancing serenading etc the next person is yeoman and yeoman belong to the peasant class down trodden class he is a servant to our knight and squire you know yeah his dressing is quite weird he has got a coat and a hood of green and a peak of feather arrows just like uh, our you know mexican tribals uh, yeah if you have seen um, english movies you might have come across those tribals right with feathers and all yeah so and one more thing you know during those time these servants they imitated their masters they imitated their master if their master is very jovial or very happy type okay servants will also be like that if the master is very serious you know servants will also be very serious so if they are ridiculous they uh, the servants will be even more ridiculous so i mean these servants are exact replica or you know uh, they are imitating their masters so yeoman he is also imitating squire and the knight since he is a servant to them he is imitating them of a squire and a knight they pretended to be very serious and you know very much 
uh, what duty bounded people but we know that they are actually not like that they are really materialistic so this person is also you know uh, behaved like square and knight as if he's uh, going to uh, undertake some big mission something like that and he also uh, had a bow and a sword mm, he is a perfect huntsman he belonged say like it's better to live in forest than to be in the country because he is familiar with the uh, ways of forest and he too had a brooch mm, a medal then yeah physical features at like a nut and brown face strong then he knew the entire craft of the forest how to hunt and all so just like our knight and squire he is also ready for anything any occurrence in the forest isn't it knight and squire uh, square uh, th those people are you know ever ready if they want to encounter a, if they want to fight with the beast of course they will not go back isn't it they will uh, they will be in the front line Similarly, our Leo man is also like that. Now, the next character is Priorus. She is a nun. And, you know, we, we know that these people, uh, clerical people or ecclesiastical people who belong to the ecclesiastical society, they are quiet, you know, very restrained. They, they lead a very restrained life. But unlike, you know, no, usual ecclesiastical people, the one that in the Canterbury Tales, Prioress, Monk, Friar, etc., they lead a very libertine life. Okay. Actually, they don't really suit to their profession. They don't really suit to their profession. See, during 14th century, so many upper class people lost their privilege and right to their land, uh, properties okay and land so for that reason so many upper class people came to rome and uh, their noble ladies no uh, yeah the noble ladies they cannot mingle with, uh, since they were leading a very noble life yeah a luxurious life it is not possible for those noble ladies to mingle with the downtrodden people so the best way for them to you know, escape from such kind of uh, shame or disreputation is to join a monastery or church. So, you know what happened? When those people lost their rights, privilege, their ladies, I mean, ladies in the next generation or, yeah, unmarried especially unmarried ladies instead of getting mingled with those downtrodden people most of them opted to join church they have joined church or monastery not out of their belief or being very religious not because of that but they wanted to escape from the disgrace and disreputation Mm, by mingling, uh, uh, by being on the road. You don't want to be on the road and get mingled with lower class people. So the best way is to join monastery. So our prioress is also like that. Okay. In, uh, her physical features, she has got an elegant nose. Mm. Uh, yeah, she is very conscious about her dressing and all. Okay. And you know, when she... Uh, eats she is very very careful that no morsel is fallen from her mouth she is pretty conscious about the table manners very conscious about her table manners and she could speak parisian french we know that ecclesiastical people speak latin during those times and french is spoken by aristocracy or aristocratic people so she knows how to uh, speak stylish parisian england 
Oh, sorry, French. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, now, so she kept so many hunting dogs, and you know she cannot uh, withstand the sight of a mouse mouse caught in a trap. Her heart is so you know she is very feeble hearted, you know very tender hearted personality. She cannot resist scream and all. Hmm? Very very delicate, very sophisticated. And her dress was very neat and tidy. Hmm? And she wore a golden brooch hmm? with inscription "Amor Vincit Omnia," just like our yeoman. Yeoman yeoman had got a, always. He always wore a medal, hmm? given uh, yeah, uh, uh, a medal. Similarly, our prioress she also wore a a golden brooch with an inscription "Amor Vincit Omnia," which means "Love conquers all." Love conquers all. I told you uh, she is very shy, very delicate. Hmm? She knows to speak. Uh, she knows how to speak uh, Parisian French. Then, yeah, and she is quite careful about carrying herself in a more neat and decent manner. And she is very delicate. And whenever she wants to claim something, she always takes oath in the name of Saint Loy. And Saint Loy is one of the fashionable, one of the stylish and most, uh, you know, handsomest uh, saint. So from that, from her ways, from her possession, from her living style, we can easily understand that this lady is never a perfect. She can she can never be a perfect nun. She doesn't suit to her profession. Heart of heart, she is secretly longing to, longing for a worldly life or a materialistic life. Okay. And in general, we can say that she is an ideal lady uh, or an uh, ideal lady to be the head of a finishing school for girls. Okay, because she is that much fashionable, very stylish. Our, our prioress is very stylish. Okay, now the monk is the another character, another ecclesiastical character, very wealthy. Mm, then he has got so many many fine dresses hmm? he is an outrider he will be he will be never in that monastery hmm? he always goes out of it for hunting and uh, uh, other purposes and he says that he doesn't believe in a life that is completely restricted to monastery all right and his favorite food is roasted swan and he keeps hunting dogs See, is a monk. He keeps hunting dogs. His favorite food is roasted swan. Yeah, and he has different types of, uh, you know, very in those days, very luxurious dressings, uh, luxurious clothings, and all. Yeah, and I told you, he's completely different from other monks, friars of that day. The next character is Friar. He is also a clergy. Uh, I mean, a character belong to church. And he had a long hanging hood, white and a thick neck. He also wore a, a, a cap like Pope. Then this person is very, you know, He's immoral. He's very, uh, yeah. He's very much immoral, and he's a wanton. He, he always helped the young girls. He always helped young girls, but only after putting them into trouble. You know, he 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 has uh, helped many girls to get married. He helped many girls to get married. But only after putting them in trouble. That, that means after using them, he will put, uh, he will give their hands to someone. So such a person, you know, uh, he 
heard confessions and uh, he prayed he, he had given them salvation and he believed that penance is best served hmm, with money whoever gives him money they will be given quick uh, sal uh, salvation okay now and this person is not familiar with the churches and other charity homes in england but he is very much familiar with the inns and brothels okay he's not pretty interested in serving those downtrodden people but he was very much interested in serving upper class people now the next one is merchant he uh, he belonged to the trade class and uh, dressing being a middle class hmm, character you know his dressing is quite weird we know that upstart people isn't it upstart people uh, suddenly raised to a particular status or a particular strata of course their dressing sense will be very weird isn't it they don't uh, they don't have a refined uh, taste or sense so this person is also like that and uh, he, yeah he is very uh, you know is every now and then he boasts about his business hmm? and he looks quite impressive and he always talks about his profits that he had made during his business but let me tell you he was in debt in reality he this person this merchant was in debt the another character the first virtuous character in canterbury tale oxford clerk okay he too belong to the middle class and his dressings uh, or his clothes were never gaudy hmm? were never gaudy hmm, his clothes were thread bar hmm? because he spends uh, money upon buying books rather than buying clothes he is very thin Mm, hollow and very serious type personality, and apart he is very studious and he talked. He, he um, you know, he talked less. So he depended. Uh, he depended uh, his friends mm, and yeah, his close relatives to buy books, etc. And his serious intention is to, you know, seek virtue. And morality. Unlike other characters, see, uh, knight and squire, they are going to Canterbury because they have to. That is the system. All right. Now, Yeoman went to Canterbury just because his masters are going there. Now, Prioress, uh, yeah. Uh, Society, that means church, has forced her to go. Similarly, monk, etc. But this person is going for a pure purpose. It is to attain virtue or to study about a higher type of, uh, or he wants to get a higher type of knowledge. Next person is man of law. So this man of law, yeah, he too belongs to upper, uh, not upper class, uh, middle class society, hmm, serving the king. Okay, sergeant of law. I told you, sergeant or man of law. His physical features are not stated. Hmm? Physical characteristics are not st uh, stated. He appears to be wise than he really is. Okay, he appears uh, to be wiser and busier than he really is. Uh, see, we know that the very characteristics of lawyers, isn't it? You might have seen in movies and not, not everyone, but a few are like that. Whenever we approach a lawyer, they they appear uh, they appear to be busy, isn't it? They appear to be busy, but if uh, in reality we can see that hmm, they they don't have much thing to do. They're simply sitting there. But this person can quote hmm, even a punctuation or comma anything from the book, hmm? and he says that twenty four into seven he is really busy with his clients. In reality, this person uh, actually doesn't have any client or anything like that i told you this is ironic the entire narration is ironic what is said is exactly opposite hmm? 
uh, what is men is exactly opposite of what is said. Okay. Now the next one is Franklin. So Franklin is a land owner. Okay. This person is a land owner. He too belongs to the middle class society. Uh, he carries a dagger and a white purse. Hmm? And he is an Epicurean and hedonist. Hmm? He loves eating and he spent his money freely hmm, enjoying good food, wine and oh, company. Okay. And his house has got, a, you know, uh, a granary. And his house is always open to all his friends. Hmm? Because he believes in the, the uh, Epicurean theory. Eat, drink and be happy. Next person, next eight men. Trade, trading class, carpenter, haberdasher, dyer, carpenter, oh yeah, uh, car, uh, carpet maker and a weaver. So, um, another group of people, guildsmen or, yeah, guildsmen. Just like the middle class people, they have recently got that status in society. Okay. They have recently become rich. Trade, I mean, trading group. So, you know, they all of them had dressed in uniform. And they are so proud to be in that group. Not only their, uh, yeah, not only them, but also their wives. They are also, you know, um, very proud of the status. I mean, the recently attained status. They are not Nobel in origin or they don't belong to any merchant class like that but trading class just attained just tasted some uh, good fortune so they are so happy you know very excited about the new fortune and new life so all of them are proudly dressed in uniform and even the uh, and their wives are even more excited than the, their has uh, them okay They are going to Canterbury because, you know, they can mingle with upper class people like knight, squire, hmm, then clergy people. And they can, they will get, they believe that they will get some upliftment in the society. They can climb that social ladder. So different people have different intention behind going to Canterbury. Now the next person is Cook. You know, <laughs> I told you, uh, knight and squire, they have a servant that is your man similarly this trading group also have a cook they too uh, uh had taken a cook with them mm? just because upper class people are taking their servant and cook so why not us they also had taken a cook with them you know this cook is very awesome mm? uh yeah he's a servant to the trading people and he has got a good sense mm? you know he knows how to cook how to roast fry and boil but the poor thing about the cook is that he has got a running sore on his groin he knows everything but he has got a bad sore on his groin and that is the uh, primary intention behind going to canterbury okay he just want to get that part healed the next person is a skipper or a shipman skipper or a shipman Okay, he belongs to the lower class. So he is a veteran sailor. Hmm? He knows every uh, cost on the Mediterranean. Yeah, every cost on the Mediterranean area. And he, yeah, see, you know, one needs great courage to travel across the uh, world, isn't it? Anything can happen. But he appears to be very courageous. Hmm? Uh, he is always ready for a battle, you know, kind of very hardcore personality. But, you know, uh, the only thing is that he doesn't know how to sit on a horse. He looked like hmm, uh, a fish out of the water whenever he is on the top of a horse. He can do anything, but he cannot sit on the top of a horse. Quite interesting, right? See, he appears to be very courageous, very bold, very brave. Still, he can't, ro uh, he can't ride a horse. Now, next character is doctor of physic. Another person. So we have seen different type of personal uh, characters, right? 
lawyer, fighter, squire, pe uh, clergy people, then yeah, clerk, then doctor, then comes the doctor. Yeah, so he belongs, he too belongs to the middle class society. Hmm? Blood red garments, maybe. <laughs> Uh, has he re uh, related to the health? Maybe he's wearing the blood red garments, slashed with bluish gray and made of taffeta silk. See these, uh, how these people are very much concerned about their clothing. And, you know, uh, he seems to have hmm, a good, great knowledge in medicine as well as in astronomy. See, he mostly cares about astronomy than in me than medicine because uh, on seeing without examining people he says that he could uh, mm, tell the very ailment or the disease of the people okay because he knows astronomy quite well just like <laughs> uh, the people in in uh, certain i'm not telling anything specific but let me tell you certain religious group i mean almost all religious group hmm, have these these kind of personalities isn't it? uh someone who can foresee or predict even without examining so he says such type of uh, per, uh, kind of person uh, he can predict uh, the illness of his patients even without examining them because he has a two, uh, written knowledge of uh, knowledge in astronomy or astrology and you know people think that this person uh, was in league with druggists just like the doctors just like the present doctors he too has got a good connection with pharmacist druggist just uh, nowadays medical representatives so this person has got a very good connection with the druggist and medical authority. So he say, uh, he can quote all uh, things related with medicine and astronomy, but he doesn't know a single line from Bible. First of all, he is not true to his profession because if he is true to his profession, he would have never gone after astronomy and astrology, isn't it? He would have stick on to the medicine. Hmm? He would have examined his uh, patients. Rather, he mostly relies upon astronomy and astrology. And for every disease, he prescribes gold as a cure. Of course, gold is used in certain medicine. Mm? Yeah, gold is used in certain medicines. But for every disease, he prescribes gold because he has a special love for this yellow metal. Okay. And during, see, I told you, yeah. During 14th century, originally, England has been swept by black uh, plague three times and it has really reduced the population of England. During that time, this person has made a huge wealth, a huge amount of money, this person. Okay, so we have understood the person, the very characteristic of this personality. Now, next character is Wifi of Bath, not Wife of Bath. Pronunciation is entirely different. It is said to be Wifi of Bath. She too belong to middle class. Hmm? She's a good stream stress. You know, she, she too has a, a hose. Hmm? She's finely dressed. Then her problem is she's deaf. She is deaf. She's beautiful, but she she's gap teeth. Hmm? In a very seductive figure, very sensual figure. She married five times. And she outlived all her husbands. I hope you got the humor behind that. She married five times and all her husbands died. So all the properties and the legacy. Well, she will get all the properties and legacies of her dead, deceased husband. Isn't it? Yeah. So now, she, now we have understood how cunning she is. Anyway, that is not directly expla explained. Chaucer has described all his characters in a very positive way but in an ironic style so if you are able to understand that you will uh, you will uh, realize the real character of this pilgrims okay they are not uh, uh, as they 
appear in the uh, tape, but they are exactly opposite of that. Their character is exactly opposite of that. Now, yeah. The next character, Parson. Okay, let me tell you, Parson is, you know, uh, uh, he's a very virtuous character. After uh, Oxford, at, you know, clerk at Oxford, this person is very virtuous. Unlike other malicious character, malicious character, this person is very virtuous and he, he does uh, all his job. Then he regularly pays his kids to the church. Yeah, he helps the poor and he practice he he first you know uh, all those people who preaches they will only preach things they won't do anything but this person before preaching he actually practices it he practices what he preaches okay and uh, he is a perfect example see monk is not perfect prioress is not perfect friar is not perfect no none of the logical characters uh mentioned in the canterbury Tales are perfect except Parson and Plowman. Okay, except Parson. Pla Parson is very true to his life. Even though he is living in poverty, he's living in poverty, he's rich in thought and deeds. Okay. Now the next character is Plowman. Hmm? So yeah, Plowman is the brother of our Parson. He is also not, you know, very concerned about his clothing, appearance, or his lifestyle. Just like his brother, he too is good. He too pays tips to the church and uh, pay, prays regularly, helps his neighbor, and a good Christian like his brother. Now, the next character is Miller. So, Miller is a, you know, big brownie uh, man who could out wrestle. Anyone out there, he could, he can out wrestle. You know, every now and then he's great. Uh, he he, um, he is ready for a fight. He's short, broad, and thick, and he has got a wart on his nose. <clears throat> he has got a very fearful appearance, and he played the bagpipe. You know, while everyone is telling the story, he played the musical instrument, and this person is blasphemous. I uh, hope you know the term blasphemy is yes, he talks against his own religion. There is no in serious intention uh, going to go Canterbury Tales. He's just going to Canterbury Tales because other pilgrims are going and he wants to uh, prove them wrong. The next character is Mansipal. Mansipal is a, you know, a steward hmm, at a law school. A servant at law school and his duty is to buy food for them okay let me tell you he is a servant at, at a law school but this person is very cunning than those lawyers to be normally lawyers are very cunning isn't it they are very shrewd but the servant at the law school is more cunning than them and you know he is he, he was able to make uh, some money for himself from that uh, amount that had been given to buy food for students. Okay, so he has saved a, a handsome sum for himself, a handsome money for himself. Next character is Reeve. So Reeve is the manager of a large estate and uh, he's a manager, okay. So he is the one who is responsible for running the everyday tasks mm, uh, of the feudal lords, etc. Mm. This person is very cruel, very cruel, uh, and uh, you know he is a nightmare for all his employees, and he is a, a favorite to employers. I repeat, he is a nightmare to all his employees and a favorite to employer. And he has reaped many awards from his employers. You know, he's too good to his employers, but very rude to rude with his employees. So he had become rich by, uh, you know, extracting the juice and blood of the of, of his employees. Okay, and stealing from his masters. The next character is Samana. So Samana again. Uh, he too belong to that clergy class, ecclesiastical class. So the main uh, 
assignment that is given to summoner is see he has to uh, summon sinners before a church court hmm, for a trial so whoever see there are a lot of people during those time it is church who decided uh, the punishment that has or the punishment or to hear the um, the very confession what the people has to say so he has been being given the charge to summon the sinners in before uh, before the church court okay so this person has got a you know uh, red complexion hmm? pimples and boils yeah he has got some skin disease and to make the matter worse he eats garlic onion wine yeah his character is very you know uh, not that great very is a libertine okay and this person is very much you know in contact with those ladies with questionable reputation i mean those ladies from the brothel very ill tempered uh, yeah lecherous etc ex person is pardon partner okay partner it uh, just like summoner clergy class ecclesiastical class and he has been given uh, the authority to sell pardons hmm, pamphlets among the sinners okay so church or uh, the other yeah church officials have given him authority to sell pamphlets or pardons to the sinners anyway this person has taken uh, has taken it as a business just because his bag is full of pardons you know the pamphlets contain pardons or those sermons it has to be given to the sinners you know what he does uh, he has got a very loud high pitch voice and with that he terrified people and he forced people to buy his pardon and that's how he become rich actually pardon or the kind of pamphlets or the books were only given to those people who had committed some mistake uh, his duty is to uh, advise those people those ill uh, you know those people who had committed mistakes to advise them and make them buy this and read instead he forced everyone to buy that pamphlet and he become rich so he writes closely with the samana samana and partner just like identical twins he writes with uh, him and takes advantage just like samana he also or uh, takes advantage of his position just like a friar you know friar is also like partner he is also quick in giving uh, salvation to those who pays him the best those who pays him good he is also like that now <clears throat> after 29 characters the host harry bailey the host harry bailey yeah he is the owner of the tabard inn in southwark he is the person who judges the story told by the 29 character and he is the one who gives them the price that is the sumptuous dinner and he is the one who suggested that they should tell two stories to the way to canterbury and on the way back so very you know quick tempered very happy type lucky go uh, personality very generous after uh, so we have seen an outline of the canterbury tales prologue to canterbury tales what we have discussed right now is prologue to canterbury don't have to study entire canterbury tales you just have prologue to canterbury and the tale so we have completed prologue to canterbury now we have one more tale before going into the tale let's discuss the very features of prologue to canterbury so the genres yeah so canterbury tales comprises many literary genres say like courtly romance fabliau exemplum allegory beast fable sermon religious composition just like you know uh, just like the arabian nights or panchatantra tales or iso fable our canterbury tales there are 24 tales right so these 24 tales are written in different genres courtly romance fabliau exemplum like that 
so exemplum is no uh, you know uh, is uh, is basically uh, a moral message hmm, with religious dimension given to the reader okay now courtly romans hope you know it's a story mostly about knights ladies noble family etc etc and beast fable fable ease of fable the main character major characters will be animals just like ease of fable fable uh these fable is also a story about animals now fablio fablio is in a short story with uh, you know happy ending and all sermon religious treaty only parson told that parson tale is a sermon you know most of these 24 tales are kind of satire or they give some message to the reader now personification <laughs> so personification is a literary device where non living things animals or some abstract ideas etc have been given human qualities so let me tell you the uh, another version or another interpretation of canterbury tales i told you there are 29 characters but these 29 characters can be seen as abstract virtues examples of abstract virtues and vices they are not actually characters but they are certain qualities like virtues and vices in human mind gluttony avarice low lust vanity pride anger uh, so these are the seven deadly sins mentioned in bible so gluttony our franklin represent gluttony one who eats isn't it he devotes his life eating uh, for uh, for eating good food and drinking wine and to enjoy life avarice i mean all those personalities some are uh, partner monk you know reeve ha uh, tradesman all the all those people who are you know very you know uh thirsty to amass wealth or to who are going after wealth those people come under avarice sloth you know yeah certain characters are very lazy isn't it very lazy you know lust our friar is very lustful summoner is very lustful beef of back lustful then prioress is lustful vanity again the prioress monk then uh, tradesman pride squire knight anger reeve shipman so you know basically they are not characters but they represent these qualities or virtues or vices in human mind moderation generosity diligence love modesty humility forgiveness so these things have been personified through the characters like plowman parson and clerk at oxford now themes what are the major themes love sex fraternity power of church betrayal rivalry religion gender love it's uh, shown through squire and wife of bath isn't it squire always spends most of his time for <clears throat> you know writing love poems uh, serenading his beloved etc wife of bath you know she is very much interested in giving love advices i mean advice related to love to young people then yeah gender role sex the friar and someone very much interested in uh, you know um forming connection between with women only after putting them in trouble okay then yeah fraternity that is shown through trade men group you know they actually uh, they are actually very happy and they walk with uh, pride just because they they belong to a union then power of church prioress monk friar actually they are corrupting the power given to them betrayal yeah that is also here wife of bath 
how will you have five husband rivalry reeve and municipal i mean some characters are not in terms with one another in this canterbury so whenever they got an opportunity to hurt other they used it they utilized it by telling a story against another religion our knight is very religious not not religious very fanatic he's fanatic then pl uh, plowman and parson they are truly religious then gender clash isn't it uh, i told you this one is written in i am big penda meter let's see the structure of the poem i am big penda uh, the canterbury tales is written in i am big penda meter so a line can see uh, see these two lines and specially from every share recent of england to canterbury they went spelling is quite different i told you spelling is quite different but w e n d e that is w e n t went present went okay so the very rhyming scheme of the canterbury is a a b b c c d d rhymed i am big pentameter first two lines will be rhyming and the next set, yeah all the consecutive lines will rhyme and there are five feet one two three four and five i hope you can see there is no you know specific uh, rule for you know scanning or dividing these lines into five feet wherever we stress there we will put the sign of stressed syllable dash is the stressed syllable and the sign like u is unstressed unstressed followed by a stressed syllable is said to be i am so what is an i am unstressed followed by a yeah stressed syllable okay unstressed stress unstressed stressed so yeah and specially usually diff, uh, you know vowels diphthongs and long vowels will be stressed mostly you know uh, writers and poets they wrote uh, poems uh, stuff like according to their convenience and that's how they formed iambic pentameter on all they we don't have any specific rules for uh, writing uh, writing verses in iambic pentameter anyway it's uh, it's according to how we pronounce certain things now the poetry tradition of canterbury is i told you heroic couplet or iambic pentameter iambic pentameter or else heroic couplet so heroic couplet a couplet the tradition form used in epic narrative poetry and all and that tradition continued till 17th century so from 13th century to 17th century most of the writers not most of the writers major yeah almost all followed this tradition in the poetry heroic couplet so, so you see the first few lines of uh, taken from prologue to canterbury so i'll show you how it is uh, read okay let me tell you one that april with shower suit when that april see i have uh, pasted both the modern version as well as the middle english version you see the difference one that april with his shower suity when that april with his shower sweet drug of ma hath pierced to rooty the drought of march has pierced to the root and bath every way in sweet liquor and bath every way in such liquor of which what you engendered is the flaw which the strength the flower is engendered one safer as eek with swatter breath when safer is also with his sweet breath inspired hath in every hole and heap has inspired in every hole and heap the tender corps and the young sun the tender corps and the young sun hath in the ramp his half course run hath yeah has run in the ramp has half course okay and small fowls make a melody and small birds make melody that slept on all night with open 
E that sleep all night with open eyes. So prick him na, uh, nature in her courageous. So pricks them nature in their hearts that long flock to go on pilgrimages. That people long to go on pilgrimages. Okay, it goes like that. <clears throat> so in this, in the beginning, here poet says that usually. You know, uh, April being the second month in the spring season, climate and the nature is very pleasant. So it is the uh, spring season that people usually opt to go for pilgrimage. Yeah, the spring season that people usually opt to go for pilgrimage. The reason has been stated here. Why? Uh, See, gentle rain, April, in the month of April, rain will be very gentle. The gentle rain and the warming sun and the gentle breeze will awaken the nature. The very gentle rain that uh, falls, hmm, it will pierce to the root of nature. It will pierce, it will, it will penetrate the earth and it will awaken the plants and yeah. And, you know, it will bath every shrubs and plants with such a sweet moisture. Saphir. Saphir is the west wind. Okay. When Saphir also with sweet breath, not only the gentle rain uh, of the April, but also Zaphir is the, you know, Zaphir is the Greek name for uh, Greek goddess of, sorry, god of West Wind. Okay. So not only gentle rain of the April, but also the West Wind also with his sweet breath puts new life into the tender uh, roots hmm? uh, in every uh, group and leaf. Means in every field, not only, it, uh, not only rain but also the sweet wind that is sapphire provides life to all those plants and shrubs in every field okay the tender crops and young sun tender crops and young sun okay see the spelling and pronunciation you don't have to worry about the spelling and pronunciation it is very easy it is pretty easy you know, you just compare and read it. Take the modern version and take the mid, uh, Middle English version. Put it side by side. Hmm? Read it line by line. Not a big deal. So, the tender crops and the young son hath ran in, uh, ran his half course. So, let me tell you, April, it's a fourth month, isn't it? January, February, March, April. So, son has run his half course. Half course in the uh, uh, yeah in that zodiac. So all oh, and small birds make melody. See small fowls make melody. See during this time, not only plants and the nature uh, that is happy, but entire creatures in the world they are also very excited. They are also very happy. So, you know, birds are sleeping with their eyes open. Hmm? Uh, so, nature prick their heart. Hmm? Prick in their heart. That means nature makes them happy. Apart from that, then longer flock to go, go on pilgrimages. People see, uh, so nature is happy, plants, yeah, plants are happy creatures and their creature i mean animals birds etc are very happy so author has uh, mentioned about all these things after describing nature animals and, and landscape uh, he has shifted towards people so it is this season people normally go for pilgrimages so all those pilgrimages are having what Palms in, uh, I mean, pa, uh, they, are, they are called palmers. Why they are uh, called palmers? Because they are having the leaf of palm tree. Hmm? Palms. Uh, yeah, palm leaf. Yeah. 
say normally during uh, monty thursday or uh, yeah for some religious uh, rituals they carry isn't it uh, the people uh, go for procession carrying palm leaves so all these people are heading to canterbury holding palm leaves and especially from every share and end so people from every nook and corner of the england they are heading to canterbury holding palm leaves of england they go to canterbury to seek the holy blissful martyr why they are going to canterbury to seek the blessing of the blissful martyr why he is said to be a martyr <clears throat> because i told you our saint thomas becket has been murdered in the church uh, upon the order given by the henry fourth okay that has helped them when they were seeking it so this person who has later canonized and became a saint he is quick in giving blessings to all those people hmm, who approached him who prayed to him okay that is why all these people are going to canterbury and i told you none of these 29 characters no, not none or except except three none of these 29 characters have any serious intention uh, in uh, on going for pilgrimage to canterbury all of them have some personal motives hmm? going to uh, canterbury shrine uh and one of them we know that some wanted to uh, uh you know an upliftment in their social status say like tradesmen some wanted to heal their so cook some want some has some disease uh like uh leprosy some are deaf hmm? some have skin disease some uh don't have beard hair yeah it's kind of different different uh their own issues so next one is so after discussing prolog to canterbury you have only one tale to study from this 20 out of the 24 you have only one tale that is nuns priest tale so let me tell you something uh you may thoroughly study prolog to canterbury and you just go through the summary of nuns priest tale okay non priest tale just have uh, just go through the summary that is pretty enough because it is very easy you know so this story is told by prioress secretary see pri i told you prioress is accompanied by a nun and she is in turn accompanied by three priest so one of the three priest uh, has told this story this is uh, basically a fable the genre of this tale is fable hmm? beast fable and it has got somewhat 626 line hmm? the poem runs in the big beast fable runs in 626 line and it is a mock epic so major character major characters are rooster portlotty hmm? rooster uh, and the hen portlotty and a fox a rooster hen and a fox the rooster's name is chondicleer and his wife's name that is hen's name is portlotly and the rival the adversary's name fox name is don russell the very peculiarity of this story is the fable is it blurs the boundary between between animal and human we know that animals cannot talk but fables in fables animal can talk think and act like human being so that is the very feature of nun priest tale and it it is also a mock epic it is ridiculing women's counsel see there are a lot of uh, husbands out there who believes or who takes the advice of their counsels or uh, less yeah advice of their wives so it is actually here you know a satire hmm? uh yeah about those type of husbands who takes their wives advice seriously and it also talks about the very importance of the dreams 
certain dreams has got significance isn't it yeah if it is recurring if the dream is recurring then it has got something to do with your life so and the theme major theme of the nun priest tale is flattery and pride yeah so anyway the outline goes like this see there lived a woman and a Mm, her daughters who are very poor, so they don't have, mm, you know, so has to uh, keep their life moving. They had mm, a cock, I mean a rooster, cattle, mm, and you know, Chanticleer is the name of that uh, rooster, and he is the. You know, such a beautiful sight to behold. Hmm? In that part of area, there was in such a, uh, a rooster hmm? who could match with its crowing. Okay, and this rooster had got seven hens, seven wives. But Lordy, L Lady Pertlotly, or the hen Lady Pertlotly, held his heart. Okay. So one day this Chandiklia or the rooster appeared to be very sad. So his favorite wife, that is Pertlotly, asked the reason for his sadness. And he said that he had a dream, a dreadful dream. And a creature uh, uh, who uh, appears like a fox had devoured him. So Chand uh, the Pertlotly became very angry. He says that he doesn't uh, appreciate or worship such a husband who is a coward. Hmm? He, he is having such kind of vision because he had taken, you know, a lot of food. Hmm? So she suggests her husband to have some purgative hmm? or some laxative. He'll be okay. Okay. And he says that, see, um, men, hmm? they, are, uh, they should never be covered and they should not give any importance to the dreams hmm? that they see in sleep. Uh, it's not worthy for a rooster like Chandiklia by expressing such a, mm, a silly thing. Uh, uh, see, Chandiklia has actually lost uh, his, uh, his play. Uh, her, I mean, yeah, she has lost uh, the respect for her husband. Okay. So anyway, Chandiklia uh, says that she uh, dreams are really significant. He quotes Cato. Uh, Cato is a Roman general. Okay, that's why. Uh, let me tell you. Just like see, telling a story or uh, having dreams, quoting the Roman general Cato, uh, etc., has got some significance. You know, these are. Um, Mostly human things, isn't it? Mostly human things. That is why I said animal and human boundaries blurred in the this story. So he says that dreams has got certain significance. So in order to convince his wife, he says uh, a story. Hmm? See two pilgrims, story within a story. I told you already this Canterbury tale is a story told by Chaucer. And again, the story is told by the pilgrims. And within that story, there is another story. See? So in order to convince his wife, Pertlotly, uh, the, uh, the rooster is telling a story that, see, two pilgrims, uh, yeah, two mm, pilgrims, uh, they started their mm, pilgrimage. So uh, upon... Mm, and when the night came, they went in search for lodging. One of them got mm, lodging, but another one was for, uh, forced to sleep in a barn. So you know what happened? The one who slept in the barn, he came, uh, yeah, he came in the uh, dream of the one who slept in the lodge. And in uh, in his dream, uh, he saw that a person told him. He is murdered, and the next day, he his body will be uh, hmm, seen near to the gate, city gate. So anyway, uh, he, uh, even though he woke up, he didn't give much significance to his dream because after all, it's a dream, and he slept again. So the next day, when he uh, 
uh, went to the barn. See, one uh, another pilgrim uh, was forced to sleep in the barn, right? And the one who slept in the lodge, uh, he woke up uh, next day and went to the barn. And when he asked to the barn owner, owner he said that, uh, see, when he came there, the, uh, he was not there. So he went in search for his friend. Hmm? He searched everywhere and just has told in the dream, just has got, he had got a vision in the dream. He had seen the body of his friend uh, mm. outside the city gate. So Sean declared through his story, he tried to, uh, you know, convince his wife. And the second story is that, again, a set of, you know, a crew of sailors are going for voyage. So one of the uh, sailors had a vision that the, you know, ship is uh, about to be drowned and all of them will uh, perish in it. Anyway, he tried to convince his friend. Mm -hmm. So he also mocked at his friend. But after starting the voyage, after a short distance, the ship sank and everyone was drowned. So John declared through these two stories, he tried to convince he tried to convince his wife, but his wife being very haughty, and you know, she laughed at her husband and she said that if he says any more silly stories like that, for sure, she will lose. Uh, already she has lost uh, respect for her husband. And if he keep if he keeps on saying stories like this, uh, or silly, I mean, trivial stories like this, he will lose all his uh, all her love for her husband okay so yeah so John clear you know uh, uh, then uh, he, uh, so has to you know uh, patch up with his wife he says uh, that woman is man's soul joy and bliss and he calls a latin phrase a latin phrase in principio mulier est hominis Confuse you actually, and he says explains the meaning of that quote. Woman is the soul bliss of a man. Okay, and yeah, and he makes love with his wife. Okay, then uh, the next day, while Chon Declare is in the farm, uh, while he was growing, you know, a fox named Don Russell came there, and he started praising the rooster. <laughs> yeah. So, and he said to the rooster that he has, he has since seen such a beautiful sight and uh, heard a beautiful crowing as that of Chon Declare, except that of his father. Mm -hmm. And he praised uh, Chon Declare saying that he would love to hear it. So, and you know, the Chon Declare believed the fox and he started to crow. Once he closed and started to crow uh, i mean the fox hold uh, mm? he held him and started to run run so hearing the crowing sound of the chon uh, declare his wife and entire creature in the farm and the farm owner the lady and her da uh, daughter started to chase the fox who was carrying the chon declare so chon declare suddenly uh, told uh, the fox that, see, entire women in the farm is chasing you. See, after all, you are a man. See, rest of the mm, women, I mean, the race is, uh, I mean, the women, uh, the entire group is chasing you. So why not throw some insult upon them? Mm, you are a man, right? Just throw some insult upon them. So believing the Chaunty Clear, oh, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, counsel given by Chaunty Clear, Fox turned back and opened his mouth so has to insult lady, daughters, hens, <laughs> and all the uh, other creatures who are chasing him. So when he opened the no sooner did he open his mouth than Chon Declare escaped to the uh, nearest branch uh, of the tree. So uh, even though, uh, you know, he was given to the counsel of his wife, later with his wisdom he escaped from the uh, mouth of a fox so this story is basically you know uh, mostly about the issue that one may encounter if uh, if he 
or she, uh, if he takes uh, his wife's counsel seriously a uh, big male chauvinistic we can say the certain critic says that you know chaucer has taken a you know a big chauvinistic stand in canterbury tales that is visible in priors episode then by leaf of bath episode and nun priest tale yeah his stand is big chauvinistic so yeah like that he escaped so in this story he says that one shouldn't take the advice of one's wife seriously if he believes in his own visions and theory that means man has to first uh, give him, uh, a man has to uh, you know believe in his own vision rather uh, rather than uh, giving importance to his wife's counsel so that's all about uh, nun priest tale both are you know both can prologue to canterbury and nun priest tale both are satires